Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, I am Dr. Rose, Assistant Professor, Department of Anatomy, Government Medical College, Trishu. In this session, we will be dealing with gametogenesis. So before moving on to the topic proper, this is a girl with Turner syndrome. We all know the karyotype of Turner syndrome, it is 45XO. What happened to the extra X chromosome? It is not, it is missing there. And because of that, she is having a short neck, she is having a short stature, and she is also suffering from cubitus valgus. So in order to understand what is happening for the X chromosome, we need to know what is happening before birth of a female child or a male child. So in this session, we will be seeing what is meant by a primordial germ cell. A quick recap about mitosis, meiosis, which you have been familiar during your school days. Then we will come to the topic gametogenesis proper with some of the applied aspects. So first we will see about the primordial germ cell. So it is from the primordial germ cell the gametes are formed. So what are gametes? They are in females we call it as ovum and in males we call it as spermatozoa. So these primordial germ cells are first formed in the epiblast during the second week of intrauterine period. So the epiblast is actually a part of embryoblast during the development after fertilization. So the details of the epiblast, the embryoblast will be dealt in detail in the coming following sessions. So from the epiblast after second week, the primordial germ cells will, will be actually transferred to the wall of the yolk sac. You can see the yolk sac here. So these primordial germ cells will be actually transferred to the wall of the yolk sac by the third week of intrauterine period. And from this wall of yolk sac, they will be again traveling through the dorsal mesentery in order to appear in the developing gonads by the end of fifth week of intrauterine period. Now, what happens to the primordial germ cell? The further development of primordial germ cell can be considered under two main headings. One is gametogenesis and the next process is cytodifferentiation. So gametogenesis is actually a reduction division because during meiosis the number of chromosomes is reduced. What will happen if there is no reduction in the number of chromosomes? We cannot, we won't be able to restore the chromosome number after fertilization. And what is cytodifferentiation? It is a process by which the germ cells complete their maturation process. So before moving on to the topic gametogenesis proper, we will see what is happening during mitosis and meiosis. This is just a quick recap for you. So mitosis is a process by which the maternal cell will be dividing into two genetically identical daughter cells by the duplication of their DNA. So there is no loss of genetic material during this cell division. It is just duplication of DNA. And it has got the first phase is known as the interphase which is further subdivided as G1 phase, S phase and G2 phase. G1 is otherwise known as gap 1. S phase is the synthetic phase where the DNA is duplicated. And the third one is known as G2 or gap 2 phase. Now after interphase, the cells will enter into prophase. So till then, we have the DNA material as a clumped mass inside the cell. During prophase, the DNA condenses to become the chromosomes and the mitotic spindles. We can consider the mitotic spindles as threads to pull the chromosomes apart. So the mitotic spindles are formed during this phase. So this is the prophase. We can see th there is no clump of DNA material here. You can very clearly see the two sets of chromosomes. Now after prophase, we have the next phase known as metaphase. During metaphase, we can see the chromosomes will be aligned in the middle of the cell. 
and it is during inner phase the chromosome pairs split. When the chromosome pairs split, the individual chromosomes are now known as sister chromatids. And these sister chromatids will be moving on to either ends of the cell. And what is happening during telophase? We have the sister chromatids now at opposite ends of the cell and new membranes, new nuclear membranes are formed around the sister chromatids. And the next phase is known as cytokinesis. So during cytokinesis, it is time for the cells to be separated. So let's see what is happening. This is the prophase. We can see the chromosomes arranged very clearly. Then in metaphase, they are aligned in the middle. We can see the formation of mitotic spindles. And in anaphase, we can see that the mitotic spindles have started pulling the chromosomes apart so that one will go to either ends of the cell. And it is in the anaphase, we can see the sister chromatids at both poles. And it is now the time for telophase. Telophase, we can see the cell itself is actually breaking into two cells. And what is the importance of knowing the details about mitosis? Suppose if there is an error in mitotic division during this process, this error will be carried on to the daughter cells. So if this is happening during embryonic development, a large number of cells will be affected because that is the time when newer cells are formed. So if this happens, if there is an error in the mitotic div division during embryonic development, a large number of cells will be affected. So what will happen if these cells are affected? It will result sometimes in an extra copy of chromosome, which we call as trisomy. There will be translocation. Some parts of the chromosome will be translocated and sometimes there will be inversion. All these errors can happen. Now let's have a quick recap about meiosis. So usually this type of division in humans occur during sexual reproduction. And what happens during meiosis? In meiosis actually it is having two phases, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. And in this process a single cell after the end of meiosis 2 will be forming four new cells. And the importance of this division is the byproduct of this cell division, the daughter cells will be haploid, the, the chromosome number will be haploid. And this is the process by which we have the formation of spermatozoa and oocytes which are again haploid in chromosome number. So that the fertilized egg will be able to restore the normal number of chromosomes. So let's have a quick recap about meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, what is happening in meiosis 1 and what is happening in meiosis 2. So in meiosis 1, again, it starts with interphase with the normal diploid number. The chromosome number will be diploid at this phase. Then it will enter to the next phase known as prophase 1. We call it as prophase 1 since it belongs to meiosis 1. So in prophase 1, it is the time for the uh, arrangement of the DNA as homologous chromosomes. There is another phase known as prometaphase. Prometaphase means before the metaphase. In this segment, the microtubules will start pulling the chromosomes to either ends of the cell. Still, the chromosome number will be deployed. And in metaphase 1, the chromosomes are now ready to be pulled and it will be arranged in the middle of the cell and still again you have the same deployed number of chromosomes. And in anaphase, this, uh, the chromosomes will be pulled apart so that they will be moving to either end of the cell. But you have to remember that again in this phase also the chromosome number is deployed because all these events are happening within the cell. So let's have a look. This is prophase 1. You can see that the chromosome number is 2n that is deployed. This is metaphase 1 where the cells are, the chromosomes are arranged in the middle. Still the chromosome number is deployed and in anaphase they are pulled to either ends and again the chromosome number is deployed and what is happening during telophase? Telophase there will be a new membrane formed that is the nuclear membrane will be formed around the chromosomes and cytokinesis is the process by which the cells are split up to form two haploid cells. So let's have a look. So in meiosis 1 
each cell, the byproduct of meiosis 1, each cell will be having 23 chromosomes and each chromosomes will be having two chromatids. That means each chromosome will be paired with two sister chromatids, but the chromosome number will be haploid. So this is prophase 1 with diploid number of chromosomes, this is metaphase 1 with again diploid number of chromosomes, anaphase 1 with again diploid number of chromosomes, telophase again di with diploid, why? Because the chromosomes are still inside a single cell and after cytokinesis the cells will be separated and you will be having a paired haploid cell. Now we will move on to the meiosis 2 part. Meiosis 2 part is actually very similar to mitosis. So what happens in prophase 2? Prophase 2 means it is the prophase of meiosis 2. Here again the chromosomes will be condensed and there will be again mitotic spindles formed and the cells are now haploid because after meiosis 1 we have a paired chromosome with haploid number of chromosomes. So these chromosomes will be arranged in the middle. Now we have metaphase 2 where there will be the formation of mitotic spindles and the next stage is anaphase 2 where the chromosome pairs are split at centromere because up to this point we can see that the chromosomes are paired with two sister chromatids. At anaphase the chromosomes split at centromeres and the sister chromatids will be moving on to either end of the cell and it is again haploid and telophase is the phase at which newer nuclear membranes are formed around the chromosome material. And in cytokinesis we have the cells separated and now we have at the end of meiosis 2 4 cells with haploid number of chromosomes but at this moment we have unpaired chromosomes when we compare with the chromosomes after the end of meiosis 1 because at the end of meiosis 1 we had paired chromosomes but at the end of meiosis 2 we will be having unpaired chromosomes that is the point which you have to keep in mind. So this is unpaired haploid number. So just to summarize we have the primordial germ cells giving rise to gametes and in mitosis the maternal cell divides to form two genetically identical daughter cells by the duplication of DNA material. And what is happening in meiosis? We have two sets of meiosis happening. One is meiosis 1 and the other one is meiosis 2. At the end of meiosis 1, we have two cells with 23 paired chromosomes, whereas at the end of meiosis 2, we have four cells still with 23 chromosomes, but this time it is unpaired. That is the difference between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Now it is time for us to move on to the topic proper that is gametogenesis. So gametogenesis can be discussed under four main phases. What are the four main phases? The first phase is extra embryonic origin of germ cells and their migration to the gonads. So the germ cells, the primordial germ cells we have already mentioned that they are seen at the yolk sac and they are then migrating to the developing gonads. So that is the extra embryonic origin of the germ cells. Now the next step is the increase in number of germ cells because in the beginning there will be only a fewer germ cells. So they need to multiply and that process we have already mentioned that is by mitosis. Now the next thing which should happen is there should be a reduction in the chromosome number because during fertilization we have two sets of chromosomes coming one from one set from the mother one set from the father. So there should be a reduction in the number of chromosomes so as to restore the number of chromosomes after fertilization. So during gametogenesis that reduction of chromosome should occur and that is by a process known as meiosis and the final step in gametogenesis is structural and functional maturation of the gametes that is the gametes are now ready for fertilization. So gametogenesis if we want to put it in a single sentence it is maturation of primordial germ cells into mature gametes. Now again gametogenesis happen in both males as well as in females. In females we call it as oogenesis 
whereas in males we call it as spermatogenesis. So first we will discuss about oogenesis. Oogenesis as we all know this is a female reproductive organ. We have the uterus and we have the two ovaries and the oogenesis will be happening within the ovaries. So let us have a look at oogenesis. So the topic oogenesis can be dealt under the following headings. First let us see what is happening before birth, before a female child is born what is happening. So before birth we have the primordial germ cells in the ovary and they will be multiplying and multiplying by a process known as mitosis. So by mitotic division larger number of primordial germ cells are formed and they are converted into oogonia. And during the third month of intrauterine period the oogonia will be transformed into primary oocyte. By the fifth month you will be having about 7 million of oogonia within the female child and by the end of seventh month the, pro, the primary oocytes will start its first meiotic division. The first meiotic division will be started in the primary oocyte but you have to keep one point in your mind that the first meiotic division though it starts before birth it is not completed before birth or after birth or, or soon after birth because it is arrested at a phase known as prophase. So the reduction division the meiotic first meiotic division will start during the seventh month of intrauterine period but it will be arrested at prophase. Now the primary oocyte is within the ovary. Now it should have a covering and that is by the formation of flattened epithelial cells around the primary oocyte. So when a primary oocyte is covered by a layer of flattened epithelial cells you call it as primary ovarian follicle or primordial follicle. So this is our primordial germ cell. Now it is getting transformed into oogonia. Later this oogonia is getting converted into primary oocyte. When the primary oocyte is covered by epithelial cells you call it as primordial follicle. Now let us see what is happening for these primary oocytes and the follicles after birth. So after birth when we take a female child we now know that the ovaries of the female child will be having primary oocytes at which stage? It will be at the resting stage of prophase. So just keep in mind one more point the prophase is further divided into leptotene, zygotene, pachetene, diplotene and diakinesis. You need not know more details about this. Just for your noting point I would like to say though we say that the primary oocyte is arrested in the prophase of first meiotic division to be more specific you have to add the stage of the prophase that is dictyotene or diplotene stage of prophase. So when a female child is born the ovaries of the female child will be containing primary oocyte at the resting stage or at the arrested prophase stage. To be more exactly it will be the dictyotene or diplotene stage of prophase. And this stage will continue until the child attains its puberty. And uh, what is actually the reason behind the arrested phase of prophase? That is by an inhibiting factor known as oocyte maturation inhibitor which is secreted by the follicular cells. So the follicular cells are the cells which are actually covering the oocyte. So these cells will be secreting an inhibitor known as oocyte maturation inhibitor and this inhibitor is, is responsible for the arrested phase of prophase in the first meiotic division. And at birth we can estimate that uh, roughly 80,000 primary oocytes are present in a female child. And during puberty when the child attains puberty there will be only roughly 40,000 oocytes and during the reproductive period only 500 will be ovulated. Now let us discuss the oogenesis under the following headings. The changes which occur for the follicles and the changes which occur for the oocyte. So let us 
first see what are the changes happening for the follicle. Every reproductive cycle will be having 15 to 20 follicles starting their maturation process. So, with the onset of reproductive cycle, the ovarian cycle, roughly 15 to 20 follicles will start getting ready to be ovulated and only one follicle will be rupturing in order to uh, expel the secondary oocyte and the rest of it will be degenerating. So, uh, with the start of every ovarian cycle, you will be having 15 to 20 follicles in the process of maturation and which are the stages through which these follicles will be passing. There will be the formation of primary follicle, there will be the formation of secondary follicle, there will be the formation of tertiary follicle which ultimately will mature to form the largest graphene follicle which will rupture in order to release the oocyte. So, let us see what do you mean by a primary ovarian follicle or primordial follicle. We just now discussed about it. So, primary ovarian follicle or primordial follicle is nothing but the primary oocyte covered with flattened follicular cells. So, if you take a primary oocyte and if it is covered with a flattened follicular cells, just a diagrammatic representation, this is the oocyte and it is covered by a layer of epithelial cells, follicular cells. This is known as the primary ovarian follicle or primordial follicle. Now, what happens next? The follicular cells will become in a cuboidal because in the primary ovarian follicle, we just had a single layer of flattened cells. These cells will now become cuboidal and they will just multiply into several layers. Now, we call these layers as granulosa cells. We can also see that there is another layer formed just around the oocyte, the green colored region. This is known as zona pellucida. So, as the follicles mature during the end of this, you call the primary follicle as secondary follicle. So, this is the primordial follicle, this is the primary oocyte, you have the granulosa cells covering it, then you have the formation of zona pellucida and towards the end of it, you call it as secondary follicle. Now, what is happening to the ovarian tissue surrounding these follicles? We know that all these events are happening within the ovarian stroma. So, the stromal tissue surrounding the follicles will get condensed to form a layer around the follicle that is known as theca folliculi. So, the ovarian tissue surrounding the granulosa cells will be forming theca folliculi. Later, this theca folliculi differentiates into an outer layer and an inner layer. The outer layer is known as theca externa. You know that the word externa means outer. So, the outer layer is known as theca externa which is usually fibrous. You can see the brown colored region here that is known as theca externa and that is usually fibrous. And the inner layer is known as theca interna which is usually glandular and vascular in nature. So, these two layers are actually formed by the ovarian tissue surrounding the follicle. Now, we can see that the granulosa cells, there are some spaces developing within the granulosa cells. There are very, very, very finer spaces in the beginning which later coalesce to form a larger space. This larger space is known as antrum. So, the primary oocyte because of the formation of the antrum will be pushed towards periphery and now the position of the primary oocyte will be shifted from the center, center to a nexendric position and the ovarian follicle will now be called as a vesicular follicle or a tertiary follicle. So, the tertiary follicle will be having a cavity within the follicle. Now, the follicle cells surrounding the oocyte will be renamed as cumulus oophorus. The, these cells surrounding the oocyte are known as cumulus oophorus or cumulus ovaricus. And finally, the tertiary follicle will become a mature follicle and the mature follicle is now known as the graphene follicle. So, the graphene follicle is a very uh, 
sure short note for the exams for any university exams this is a favorite topic for the examiners so what do you mean by a graphene follicle so this is just a diagrammatic representation of the graphene follicle so it is a mature follicle containing a secondary oocyte so this is actually just before ovulation so the primary oocyte will be now converted into a secondary oocyte that the first meiotic division will be completed that is why we get a secondary oocyte here so just before ovulation the primary oocyte will be converted into secondary oocyte that means the first meiotic division is over and there will be the release of a polar body can you see a very small polar body polar body here this polar body is actually lying in the perivitelline space so perivitelline space is a space just outside the vitelline membrane so the vitelline membrane will be covering the oocyte and just outside to it there will be a space known as perivitelline space and the polar body after the first meiotic division will be seen in the perivitelline space so there will be the formation of secondary oocyte with a polar body lying in the perivitelline space and the size of the graphene follicle is said to be roughly 20 to 25 mm in diameter and when you look at the secondary oocyte still you have the immediate covering known as zona pellucida so the zona pellucida is actually still covering the secondary oocyte within the graphene follicle and what are the other structures present in a graphene follicle you have the membrana granulosa cells you have the cumulus oophorus then you have the theca externa and you have the theca interna so a graphene follicle consists of from outer to inner you have the theca externa which is the fibrous layer you have the theca interna which is a vascular or glandular layer then you have the membrana granulosa cells then you have a larger cavity which is the antral cavity the fluid pressure of which will help to rupture the follicle then you have the granulosa cells covering immediately the oocyte which is now known as the cumulus oophorus then you have the zona pellucida then you have the polar body in the perivitelline space then you have the vitelline membrane covering the secondary oocyte so these are the structures which you get in the graphene follicle so till now we discussed about the changes happening for a follicle starting from primordial follicle we covered primary follicle secondary follicle tertiary follicle and up to a point which the graphene follicle is formed so simultaneously there are changes happening in the oocyte as well within the follicle so now let's see what are the changes happening to the oocyte which is situated on inside the graphene follicle or whichever follicle it is first we will see the formation of primordial germ cell that is roughly during the fifth week of intrauterine period now the primordial germ cell will be converted into oogonia just have a look at the chromosome number it is 44 xx the diploid number of chromosomes so the primordial germ cell is having a diploid set of chromosome the oogonia as well is having a diploid set of chromosome now it is converted into primary oocyte when is this happening this is happening roughly during the third month of intrauterine period that is during the first trimester and again the chromosome number is diploid after that you have the primary oocyte in the prophase because the first meiotic division is not completed before birth so you have the primary oocyte which is arrested in the prophase of first meiotic division later what happens is at the time of birth we have the primary oocyte arrested in the prophase of first meiotic division and if you want to say it more precisely it is the diplotene or dictyotene stage of prophase 1 and before ovulation that is at the time of puberty after uh, the puber after the child attains puberty she will be having regular cycles regular ovarian cycles so just before ovulation the first meiotic division will be completed and there will be the release of secondary oocyte 
Now look at the chromosome number. The secondary oocyte will be having the haploid number of chromosomes that is 22x. Along with that there will be an expulsion of polar body that is known as first polar body with again the same haploid number of chromosomes. What happens to the secondary oocyte? It will enter into the second meiotic division. So let us have a look this is the ovary. You can see the different stages of follicles. This, these are the primordial, primary, secondary, tertiary and ultimately we have the graphene follicle which is rupturing just before ovulation. So second meiotic division is arrested. So when the graphene follicle ruptures, the oocyte will be the secondary oocyte but it has entered into the secondary, second meiotic division but the second meiotic division is not completed but it is arrested again at the metaphase. So when are you expecting the completion of second meiotic division? The second meiotic division is completed only if the secondary oocyte is fertilized. That is a very important point you have to keep in mind. So what will happen if the secondary oocyte is not fertilized, is not getting fertilized? It will just degenerate without completing its second meiotic division. That is something interesting to know, right? So at the time of ovulation, the graphene follicle will be rupturing and it will be releasing the secondary oocyte. And the secondary oocyte will be entering into the second meiotic division, but the second meiotic division will not be completed, but it will be arrested in the metaphase. And this will be completed only during fertilization. Now at the ovulation, you call this complex as oocyte cumulus complex, the complex which is released. At the time of ovulation, you call it as oocyte cumulus complex. So what are the components of oocyte cumulus complex? This is considered as an oocyte cumulus complex because as the graphene follicle is rupturing, the entire graphene follicle is not just coming out of the ovary. It, some of the parts of the graphene follicle are staying back and only some part is getting released. So the part which is getting released is known as the oocyte cumulus complex. So let us see what are the components of oocyte cumulus complex. So it consists of secondary oocyte at the arrested metaphase. So metaphase of which division? It is the second meiotic division. So the, at that stage it is arrested. So the oocyte will be in the arrested metaphase of second meiotic division. Along with that what are the other structures accompanying? The zona pilosida will be still there surrounding the secondary oocyte and around that you can see two or three layers of corona radiata. So at the time of fertilization there will be a mature ovum, first polar body and second polar body. And sometimes this first polar body will again undergo second meiotic division which will again give rise to two more polar bodies. So the secondary oocyte will be receiving most of the cytoplasm from the primary oocyte. So in the end of the oogenesis there will be one ovum and three polar bodies formed from a single primary oocyte. And what will happen if there is no fertilization? If there is no fertilization the secondary oocyte which is arrested at the metaphase will just degenerate without completing its second meiotic division. So this is the oogonia. Now you can see the formation of primary oocyte. Now it is time for the first meiotic division. Again after the first meiotic division the primary oocyte will be forming the first polar body and the secondary oocyte. So this is what we have seen in a graphene follicle. So when we look at the graphene follicle, we can see a secondary oocyte and we can see the first polar body in the perivitaline space. After that, the secondary oocyte will undergo second meiotic division. Usually the second meiotic division is arrested at metaphase and it will be completed only if fertilization happens. So if fertilization happens, the secondary oocyte 
will be converted into a mature ovum and it will be releasing its second polar body. Sometimes this first polar body as the primary oocytes undergo meiotic division, this first polar body will also undergo a meiotic division and will give rise to two polar bodies. So what will happen? In the end, we can see a mature ovum with three polar bodies instead of two polar bodies. So all these events happen within the ovary and the events which is happening in a sequential manner within the ovary is known as ovarian cycle. So ovarian cycle can be defined as the cyclical changes happening in the ovary and this includes the development of ovarian follicles, the ovulation and the formation of corpus luteum. So the details of the ovarian cycle and menstrual cycle will be dealt in next session known as the reproductive cycle. Just for the time being I am just mentioning the important points of the ovarian cycle and menstrual cycle. So these ovarian cycles will be actually occurring at a particular interval and it persists throughout the reproductive period of a female and this usually terminates at menopause. And the main control of the ovarian cycle is hormonal mechanism and the hypothalamus will be secreting gonadotropin releasing hormone which will be stimulating the pituitary in order to release the two main hormones the FSH and LH. What do you mean by FSH and what do you mean by LH? FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone and LH stands for luteinizing hormone. So as the term implies we can uh, come to a conclusion that the follicle stimulating hormone should definitely stimulate the follicles and luteinizing hormone will be coming from the or stimulating the formation of corpus luteum. So this is it follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone and these are responsible for the cyclical changes of the ovary and the growth of endometrium. The follicle stimulating hormone will ultimately result in the growth of the ovarian follicles which will actually result in the secretion of estrogen. So this is in a nutshell about the ovarian cycle and menstrual cycle. So the ovarian cycle is actually divided into two phases. The first phase we call it as follicular phase and the second phase we call it as luteal phase. Follicular phase means the formation of the follicles and luteal phase is something which has got to do with formation of corpus luteum. And what happens in follicular phase and luteal phase? The follicular phase, the follicular cells will be liberating estrogen and in luteal phase the corpus luteum will be forming the progesterone and these hormones are held responsible for the changes occurring in the endometrium and ultimately this will result in the menstrual cycle. Now just a few words about the menstrual cycle. There are four phases based on the changes happening in the endometrium. So a menstrual cycle can be divided into four phases. The first phase is known as menstrual phase. It starts from day 1 to day 4. The next phase is known as proliferative phase. It starts from day 5 to day 14. The next phase is known as secretory phase which starts from 15th day till 25th day and the last one is premenstrual phase just before the menstrual phase that is about 26 to 28 days. So this one is menstrual phase which is roughly 1 to 4 days. Then you have the proliferative phase that is roughly 5 to 14 days. Then you have the secretory phase which is from 15 to 25 days and a very small phase just before menstruation that is known as premenstrual phase which is about 26 to 28 days. So it's time for us to summarize the events happening during oogenesis before moving on to spermatogenesis. So what are the events happening during oogenesis? We have the primordial germ cells which are in the walls of the yolk sac which are shifting their position into the developing gonads. Then you have the formation of oogonia which is getting converted into primary oocyte, secondary oocyte and uh, at birth what about the stage of the oocyte? It will be in the diplotene stage or dictyotene stage of prophase 1 
and the second meiotic division will be arrested at metaphase just before ovulation and this will be completed the second meiotic division will be completed only during fertilization and if there is no fertilization the secondary oocyte will be again arrested at the metaphase and it won't be able to complete its second meiotic division that will be resulting in the degeneration of the secondary oocyte if the fertilization is not happening so this is the primordial follicle we have the formation of primary follicle secondary follicle and tertiary follicles these are the growing follicles which will be again forming the graphene follicle with the liberation of the mature ovum that is what is meant by ovulation and the remaining part of the graphene follicle which is inside the ovary will be forming the corpus luteum the changes occurring for the oocyte first we have the oogonia which is developing into primary oocyte which will be again converted into secondary oocyte if fertilization is happening that will result in the formation of zygote so we have the first polar body here with the formation of secondary oocyte and we have the second polar body here after the fertilization let's move on to the next topic that is spermatogenesis what is mean, meant by spermatogenesis genesis means development so spermatogenesis means transformation of spermatogonia to mature spermatozoa so we need mature spermatozoa for fertilization and the primitive form are known as spermatogonia so the spermatogonia has to undergo series of changes in order to form mature spermatozoa so the two major events happening during spermatogenesis are one is spermatogenesis proper and the other one is known as spermiogenesis so spermatogenesis when we compare with oogenesis it just begins only at puberty whereas oogenesis will be starting before birth and spermatogenesis will be beginning only at the time of puberty so what about at birth at birth the germ cells the primordial germ cells are simply located in the sex cords of testis the genital ridges prevent the prenatal entry into meiosis so there is an inhibiting factor here secreted by the sertoli cells of testis so the sertoli cells of testis will be secreting a male meiosis inhibitor that is known as male meiosis inhibitor this male meiosis inhibitor will actually prevent the germ cells from entering into meiosis that is the reason why you get all these spermatogonia as it is till the time of puberty so these factors the male meiosis inhibitors secreted by the sertoli cells prevents the spermatogonia from entering into meiosis before birth and up to puberty now the surface cells surface epithelial cells of the testis will be getting transformed into the sustentacular cells or sertoli cells and the sex cord cells will be forming the seminiferous tubules of testis we have the primordial germ cells as we have already seen in oogenesis they are actually giving rise to a group of cells known as type a dark spermatogonia what happens to type a dark spermatogonia the type a dark spermatogonia will be forming more of type a dark spermatogonia and some of type a pale spermatogonia so we have the primordial germ cells forming type a dark spermatogonia which is further forming again more of type a dark spermatogonia and some of type a pale spermatogonia so you have two groups one is dark type and the other one is pale type it is the pale type which is responsible for further development that is the type b spermatogonia is actually formed from type a pale spermatogonia and what is happening for the remaining type a dark spermatogonia they are actually again forming type a pale spermatogonia so for the spermatogenesis to happen we need type a pale spermatogonia that is the important point now the type a pale spermatogonia will be forming more of type b spermatogonia which is further dividing to form 
primary spermatocytes which again divides to form secondary spermatocytes which again divides to form the spermatids. So, this entire process starting from primordial germ cell to type A dark spermatogonia, then we have type A pale spermatogonia, then we have type B spermatogonia which is again dividing into primary spermatocytes, secondary spermatocytes and spermatids consists the spermatogenesis. So, the formation of primary spermatocytes from the type B spermatogonia, this step is actually known as spermatocytosis. Just keep in mind the term spermatocytosis. The primary spermatocytes are actually formed from type B spermatogonia. This process of formation of primary spermatocytes from type B spermatogonia is known as spermatocytosis. And you can have a look at the chromosome number as well. Even at the level of primary spermatocytes, we have the diploid number of chromosomes. And this primary spermatocyte will be undergoing first meiotic division to form the secondary spermatocytes. The primary spermatocytes are actually said to be the largest spermatogenic cells. And these primary spermatocytes will be undergoing the first meiotic division to form the secondary spermatocytes. The secondary spermatocytes can have two options because the diploid number is 44XY. If it is divided into 2, there are two options. The X and Y will go with 22 as two options that is 22 plus X or 22 plus Y. So, this is actually determining the sex of the fetus. If 22 plus X is fusing with 22 plus X of ovary, the mature ovum, we get a female and if 22 plus Y of sperm is actually fusing with the mature ovum, again 22 plus X, we get a male because 22 plus X is a common factor from a mature ovum. But from a sperm, we can have these two options, either 22 plus X or 22 plus Y and this determines the sex of the fetus. Now, the second meiotic division will be resulting in the formation of haploid spermatids. So, ultimately at the end of the spermatogenesis, if we have a look, one primary spermatocyte will be leading to the formation of four haploid spermatids. Now, what do you mean by the word or the term spermiogenesis? You might have heard about spermatogenesis. So, what do you mean by spermiogenesis? We just discussed that at the end of spermatogenesis, we are having haploid spermatids, but they are not capable of fertilization. So, we need to make them mature enough. So, the spermatids are actually large round cells with dark stained nucleus. They are just cells with dark stained nucleus and they will remain in the place where they are. So, they need to move from the, from the point of formation to a place where the fertilization happens. So, what should happen? There should be some metamorphosis happening for the spermatids so that it will be converted into a mature spermatozoa. But there should not be any cell division happening. This is just a maturation process. So, spermiogenesis means the metamorphosis of spermatids to spermatozoa without further cell division. That is the process known as spermiogenesis. Only if spermiogenesis happens, the entire spermatogenesis will be complete. So, let us have a look. We have the spermatids like this, larger cells with round nucleus, dark stained nucleus, which will be actually getting converted or metamorphosed to form the final sperm. This is our sperm, the final stage. So, spermiogenesis, what are the events happening during spermiogenesis? The first one is there will be a formation of head cap or acrosome cap. Then we have, so this is the acrosome cap, this is the nucleus, the large round nucleus, dark stain nucleus. You can see a vesicle like thing above it that is known as acrosome cap. Then the nucleus will be condensing and it will be covered by the acrosome cap. So, you have the nucleus condensed in the middle 
and this acrosome cap will be now just covering the upper part of the nucleus and it projects out as the head of the spermatozoa. The nucleus actually condenses and it projects out as the head of the spermatozoa. Now the rest of the parts of the sperm that is the formation of neck, middle piece and tail all the rest of the sperm parts will be formed simultaneously. As these are formed the part of the cytoplasm will be actually pinched off because during fertilization the main amount of cytoplasm comes from the maternal side. So there is no need of much cytoplasm with the sperm. So the remaining cytoplasm is actually degenerate or shed off as residual bodies. So this is actually the pinched off cytoplasm known as the residual bodies with the mature sperm. So this is the residual body. So let us see the events happening in a nutshell. We can see the Golgi apparatus, this is the nucleus, this is the mitochondria and this is the Golgi apparatus. From the Golgi apparatus it will be forming the acrosomal cap which is actually lying over the head of sperm that is formed by the nucleus. So this is the nucleus which is forming the head of sperm. Then you have the centrosome which is actually dividing into proximal and distal centrioles. The proximal part will be giving rise to the neck, formation of neck and the distal part to the annulus. Then you have the mitochondria which will be forming a sheet around the middle piece. So these are the final parts of a sperm. It has got an acrosomal cap, it has got a head, it has got a neck, it has got a middle piece which is wrapped with the mitochondrial sheet and the tail or the principal piece and the tail. So these are the different parts of a sperm. And the spermatogonium actually mature into spermatozoa and it will take roughly around 64 to 74 days. That is the time period required for a spermatogonium to mature into a spermatozoa. And further maturation after the formation of sper spermatid into spermatozoa that is the process is known as spermiogenesis roughly takes about 24 days. So the entire spermatogenesis will be happening in 74 days out of which the spermiogenesis will be happening during last 24 days. The spermatozoa will be first in the seminiferous tubules of the testis. So this is the testis and you will be having numerous seminiferous tubules within the testis. It is inside the seminiferous tubules you have the formation of spermatozoa. So at the time of formation of spermatozoa they are actually non-motile, they are not capable of motility. Then what happens? This will be actually passing through epididymis. This is the epididymis which is lying just behind the testis. It has got a head, body and tail. The details of it will be dealt in gross anatomy sections. So this is the epididymis. So the spermatozoa will be passing through the epididymis and while it passes through the epididymis, it will be undergoing a biochemical maturation process. So what is meant by biochemical maturation process? It is just a formation of glycoprotein coating and surface modifications. So after this, this will be capable of moving on its own. So this is epididymis and finally it will be reaching the ejaculatory duct and it will be ejaculated along with the secretions from the prostate gland and the seminal vesicle. You have the prostate gland and you have the seminal vesicle. So this will be actually ejaculated along with the secretions from the prostate gland and seminal vesicle. After that the sperms will be having independent motion. They will reach the cervix and they will actually crawl into the uterine tube for fertilization. So in, before uh, moving on to the clinical aspects, let us have a quick summary about the spermatogenesis. So we have the primordial germ cells which are getting converted into spermatogonia. We have seen two types of spermatogonia type A dark and type A pale. So type A dark will be actually giving rise to type A pale spermatogonia which is again entering into the formation of sperms by forming type B spermatogonia. Then 
what happens to the type B spermatogonia? They will be forming the primary spermatocyte. Later, that will be getting converted into secondary spermatocyte, which will be moving on to the formation of spermatids, spermatozoa, and finally, the mature sperm. So, the spermatogenesis is actually starting only at puberty. That is a very important point you should keep in mind because compared to oogenesis which is happening even before birth, spermatogenesis will happen only at the time of puberty and it is an ongoing process till death it is set. But oogenesis will not be an ongoing process and it will come to a standstill at the time of menopause. The time period is usually 74 days and one primary oocyte is capable of forming four haploid spermatids. So, we can see the different, this is cut section of a testis, this is testis, cut section of testis into lobules, we have, we can see many seminiferous tubules, this is a cut section of a seminiferous tubule with Sertoli cells and the st different stages of spermatogonia and again this is the Sertoli cell with different stages and finally, the sperms are liberated into the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. And these are the spermatids and these spermatids will undergo a maturation process known as spermiogenesis in order to form mature sperm. Let us have a quick comparison between an oocyte and a sperm. When we compare an oocyte to a sperm, oocyte is usually massive because it has got a larger proportion of cytoplasm and this cytoplasm is actually contributing to the formation of zygote. Whereas, sperm there is no much amount of cytoplasm, hence it is not massive. Oocyte is not capable of moving on its own, hence it is said to be immotile, whereas sperms are capable of moving on its own and they are motile. There will be abundance of cytoplasm with yolk granules in the oocyte, which is actually needed for the nourishment of zygote after fertilization, whereas sperm has got only a scanty amount of cytoplasm. About the chromosome constitution, Oocyte will always have 23X chromosome pattern, whereas sperm can have either 23X or 23Y. If 23X is uniting with 23X of oocyte, we get a female and if 23Y is uniting with 23X, we get a male. So, sperm is the deciding factor of the sex of the fetus. Coming to the clinical aspects. The chromosomal abnormalities usually happen if there is some errors in the division mechanism. We have already discussed about mitosis, meiosis, gametogenesis, everything. So, all these are cell divisions in the cells. So, if there is some error in these cell divisions, it will be actually carried on to the daughter cells and that will result in many anomalies. So, the chromosomal anomalies can be of two main categories. One is numerical anomalies and the other one is structural anomaly. What do you mean by numerical anomaly? Numerical anomaly again as the word implies, it is something uh, with respect to the number of chromosomes. So, usually this happens when there is non-disjunction of autosomes or sex chromosomes during meiosis. So, if there is a meiotic cell division happening, this is a diploid number, diploid number again. If there is non-disjunction, if they are not moving apart, what will happen? One cell will will not be having any set of chromosomes, one will be having a double set of chromosomes. And if such set of chromosome will be uh, actually fertilizing with a haploid number, the ultimate result will be a triploid. So, that is the euploid stage. Euploid the word meaning is more than haploid. So, if it is a multiple of 2, multiple of 3, multiple of 4, you call it as euploid. And if it is a multiple of 2, you call it as diploid. If it is more than 2, you call it as polyploid and triploid comes under polyploidy. So, numerical anomaly is nothing but an increase or decrease in the number of chromosomes. If there is non-disjunction, one option is one set will be having diploid number of chromosome and if this happens to unite with a haploid set, ultimately the cell will be having a triploid set. Euploid the word meaning is more than one set of chromosomes that is more than the haploid set of chromosome. So, it can be diploid or triploid or the multiples and if it is more than diploid number you call it as polyploid. 
Now there is another term known as aneuploid which again comes under the numerical anomaly. Aneuploid means there is no increase in the number of chromosomes as multiples but there is an increase of one chromosome number or there is a decrease in one chromosome number that is gain or loss of a single chromosome that is known as aneuploid stage. So if there is one less you call it as monosomy, if there is one more you call it as trisomy, if there is two less you call it as nullisomy likewise we will name it. So let us have a quick look of the chromosome pattern. What will happen if there is non-distinction at this stage? So this will be seen as single chromatids. If there is non-distinction at this stage at the first meiotic division one cell will be empty and one cell will be having the entire set of chromosome. If you consider this as a single homologous pair of chromosome that single homologous pair will be maintained throughout but the other cell will be will not be having any chromosome in it. So if one haploid set with a one single homologous chromosome meets a paired homologous chromosome ultimately that single chromosome pattern will not be having two instead there will be three, num three chromosomes one paired and one homologous chromosome coming from the other parent. So ultimately there will be three chromosomal chromatids actually. So that is that condition is known as trisomy. But what will happen if this empty cell fuses with the haploid or the single chromatid of a homologous pair of chromosome that will result in monosomy that is only one chromosome is there and there is no counterpart for it. So that condition is known as monosomy. So if one chromosome is missing you call it as monosomy if there is an addition that you then you call it as trisomy if there is two chromosome missing the ultimately the cell won't be having anything that is nullisomy. The important clinical condition as far as trisomy is concerned is down syndrome. This will be happening in the 21st chromosome in case of down syndrome and that is known as trisomy 21 or down syndrome. All the rest of the chromosomes will not be affected only the homologous pair of 21st will be affected. So from one parent they will be getting one pair of homologous chromosome and the other parent they will be getting only a single, the, it will not be paired. So ideally it should not be paired. So in case of non-distinction one parent will be giving a paired set of homologous chromosome and from the other you will get a normal unpaired set. So ultimately there will be three chromosomes in one set of chromosome that is known as trisomy and the commonest condition of trisomy is 21st trisomy which is known as Down syndrome. Now, other sets of chromosomal anomalies are mosaicism, translocation. So what do you mean by mosaicism? Mosaicism is a condition where some of the cells will be abnormal and some cells will be normal. That is if you take a group of cells in from, a same from the same body, one group of cells will be having some alterations in the chromosome pattern whereas the other cells will remain normal. That is known as mosaicism and translocation the word meaning is there will be some breakage of the chromosome and there will be re reunion of the same. That condition is known as translocation. These are the numerical abnormalities and the structural abnormalities will be the breakage of the chromosomes due to some external features like the drugs, radiations or viruses. So what will happen? There will be a deletion of a part of chromosome that is known as one example for that is if there is a deletion or a partial deletion of a short arm of chromosome 5 that is known as Credu Chat syndrome, cat like cry. Have you heard about cat like cry? That condition is known as Credu Chat syndrome and that is usually due to a partial deletion of short arm of chromosome 5. Another condition is known as micro deletion. In micro deletion there will be deletion of adjacent genes. And two important syndromes are Angerman syndrome and Pradavilli syndrome. And Angerman syndrome, it is usually the maternal component which is undergoing microdeletion. And Pradavilli syndrome, it is usually the paternal component which is undergoing microdeletion. All these are actually genetic topics. I just wanted to convey these ideas in this session because 
All these happen if there is some error during the initial cell division. So, if there is some error during the initial cell divisions, it will result in chromosomal anomalies, it can be numerical anomalies, it can be structural anomalies and it will result in wide range of clinical syndromes. So, that is all about the gametogenesis in a nutshell. Thanks for watching.